What's up everyone, Adam from Cape Crawlers. Today's video is gonna be about beginner mods to the SCX24. I'm gonna give you five tips plus one bonus tip on how to guide you towards success when you start modifying your SCX24. And I'm going to do this by answering some of the most common questions that I get asked on Instagram and YouTube and via email. This is V2 of this video with new and updated information. So I hope you guys find this fun. I hope you find it informative. Let's dive in and check out tip number one. Tip number one, rather question number one that I get asked pretty frequently is what tools do I need to work on these things? What are the core tools that I need to get to work on these and install these mods that I'm planning on getting? So I'm gonna give you my short list and then I'm gonna show you what I use for my, my most common tools, what I use the most and what I keep on hand. So your core set of tools should include a 0.05 hex driver, a 1.5 hex driver, and a four millimeter nut driver. Those three things are gonna do almost everything that you need to do for the foreseeable future on your SCX24. I encourage you to spend the money on a good 0.05 inch hex driver. I personally use the MIP. This is about 18 bucks, which felt like a lot at the time, but it's worth it to spend the money on a good precision, well-fitting tool. These things are great and I've not regretted the purchase whatsoever. It works really good. You can also get tool kits on Amazon or Little Guy Racing Parts makes a good one for about 20 bucks that has these three plus a 1.3 millimeter hex driver. So it's definitely worth it to save yourself the headache and buy a good tool set right off the bat because you're going to need it. So the 0.05 does 99% of the hardware on the SCX24. The 1.5 is going to do the bigger size bolts like if you change motors you're going to need a 1.5 for that. If you get into beadlock wheels, you're going to need a 1.5 for a lot of those wheel screws, although some of those also use the 0.05. When you start changing your wheels, you're going to need that 4mm nut driver because the nylon locking nut on the wheels of the SCX24 is a 4mm. So that's why you need that core set of tools because it's what you're going to use the most. So those three things, those are your core tools right there, and those are the ones that you should always have handy and keep on you in your toolkit, in your backpack, or whatever. Those are the necessities. Now, I would encourage you to expand your toolkit a little bit more and include some things that will make your life easier as you start modifying these things. So I'm gonna give you my expanded list and kind of my go-to tool set. So I would expand on that to say, you should get a good set of tweezers, some hobby grade metal tweezers. When tweezers don't get the job done, you should get some good needle nose pliers. I would encourage you to get some small screwdrivers and some of these very small Phillips head screwdrivers. I would encourage you to keep some silicone grease, some blue Loctite, and keep those handy as well. Tip number two, arguably the most important tip of this video as you get modifying your SCX 24s and you get into your build and you start putting on your parts, you're gonna be really excited, you're gonna be pumped to get those performance gains. Do not over tighten anything on these little rigs. You will break screws, you will bind up your drivetrain. You'll just you'll wreak havoc on your build. So do not over tighten anything as you're working on these little rigs. Now, some of the common pitfalls of this are steering knuckles, wheel nuts, and the trans the nylon locking nut on the transmission. So let's take a look at some examples, and I'll show you exactly what I mean and some of the dangers of over tightening these things. All right, let's look at some real world examples. So we're gonna use our C10 here for our demonstration. Let's start off with the transmission because this is an easy one. So if you're gonna change motors, which happens pretty frequently because the stock motor in the SCX24s isn't very powerful and will likely crap out on you pretty quickly. So you'll likely end up swapping motors whether that's for a stock one or an upgrade one either way when you get into the motor and the transmission your transmission cover off this is where the pinion gear would mesh with this spur gear right here this nylon nut here on the transmission it is very critical that you don't over tighten this and i speak from experience because in this very rig I burnt out three brand new motors because I kept over tightening this nut and it took me forever to finally figure out what was going on. Because you're going to take this 
spur gear off to get to your motor mount. Okay, so your motor would bolt on right here. So you have to take the spur gear off to get to the bolts that hold the motor on. So let's say you change your motor out, you're getting ready to put your spur gear back on. You're only going to tighten it. I usually stop when I feel just the slightest bit of resistance and then I check to see where I am as far as space goes. And then I'm just going to very gently snug this up. I just want to tighten this just enough so that you don't have slop in the gear. And it's almost like finger tight. This one could go a little bit more because this is a newer nut on here, but you just want to make sure I like just a tiny bit of play in it. Again, I can just wiggle that gear just a little bit, and that lets me know that this is not too tight. If you tighten this all the way down, okay, let's say I, you can feel it, feel the friction in the transmission right here. And it may not feel like enough to make a big difference, but believe me, these little motors any type of drag from the transmission or the drivetrain is going to prematurely fry your motor. So we're going to back that up nice and smooth. Another common occurrence, probably the most common occurrence, is the wheels. So the wheels, same thing. You want to do fairly loose, like, and this is counterintuitive, especially if you're coming from the automotive world. You want to you have the urge to reef on these things and make them as tight as possible because you don't want your lugs coming loose. That's not how it works on these little things. So when you put your wheel back on your hex here, this is a little different because it has hex extensions and the, it's got an extended wheel nut, but the principles are the same. So it's the same thing. Just tighten it on there just until you hit and you start to feel that resistance. Now what you want is just, you want to be able to move that tire with virtually no resistance. And I'll see if I can demonstrate what happens if you go too tight. This isn't a good example of going too tight. Let me grab another build here. So the hex extensions and the axle setup on the C10 actually prevent me from doing this wrong. So here's, the, we'll use the Bronco for this purpose then. So here we got the SCX24 Bronco. See that you, you just no effort at all to move that wheel. That's what you want. But if you over tighten it and you you lock that, see even the same thing with the transmission gear. It's just got it's got drag there. I can feel it. It's still moving. So you might think that's okay, but it's not. This is gonna burn up your motor and cause issues. If you go any further. And then you can seize that wheel entirely. So, and again, if you're new to the hobby, you might not catch this, but that's not what you want. That's bad news. And what this, you'll be able to tell, because you're going to get, you're going to get the twist in the chassis. It's going to, it's going to bind up there, and it's going to push. You'll, you'll see your suspension raise, and then, you know, if you go forward, it'll bind up that way. If you go backwards, it'll bind up that way. So those are good tips. You, you know something's wrong if your body starts to twist and starts to raise or dive in one way or the other. Check that corner wheel to make sure that it's not too tight. Another common occurrence of over-tightening syndrome is the steering knuckles. So I'm just going to undo the steering linkage just to show you. So with your steering knuckles, again, similar to the tires you want no friction and no effort to make that knuckle move because any drag on this is going to prematurely burn out your servo so to tighten your knuckles here you've got one bolt there and one on the bottom so you want to make sure you tighten your knuckles without your steering linkage attached so that you can assess your tolerances here so you do your knuckles first and then attach your steering linkage once you know that your knuckles are set.
So if we over tighten this, let's tighten this thing up. See, it's it's virtually locked. So this is, yeah, and you can move it with your fingers. So you might think it's okay, but again, it's it's definitely not because that's going to fry your servo pretty quickly. So a good trick, you kind of hold it at an angle here after you've tightened it, and then just start start loosening it. And when it falls under its own weight, that's a good indicator that you've got a good good torque on it right there. Tip number three, question number three, what batteries do I run and what charger do I run? So batteries and charging for these things is a deep topic that we could do a whole nother video on. But for the purpose of this video and for straight up beginners, I'm gonna give you just kind of some inexpensive beginner options and go over what I use, why I use it, and then talk about these things in particular. Just keep in mind that getting into batteries and battery storage and battery safety, there's a lot to talk about on that topic. So we're gonna kind of gloss over it in this video, but if you wanna dive into it more, there's plenty of resources online for LiPo battery storage and maintenance and chargers and all those things. So I encourage you to take a deeper dive if you wish, but let's dive in and take a look at what I use and what I recommend. So right out of the box, the SCX24 comes with this setup right here. You get these 350 MAH, which stands for milliamp. You get these 350 milliamp batteries. It's a 2S, two cell LiPo battery. And you get this charger that comes with it. These plug into your standard USB port. Battery plugs in here. It's got some LED lights in here that give you your indicators on whether it's charged or what it's doing. So this is your very, very rudimentary setup that comes with the SCX24s. And most crawlers, RTR crawlers, ready to run, are gonna be a similar setup to this, very similar charging mechanism and similar batteries. These batteries are decent, they just don't last very long, especially when you start adding weight and adding power. This is just not gonna do you any good. Your runtime is gonna decrease to the point where you're just gonna be changing these things out every 10 minutes and you're gonna be crying for bigger batteries. So I'm gonna show you what I run for batteries and then how I charge these things. Two of my favorite 2S batteries are the EcoPower 450 milliamp trail batteries. Now I really like these because of the thin profile. They're not much bigger than the stock battery, but they just seem to have a tremendously longer runtime. I really, really like these because they're thin and they can fit really nicely in my builds and I just get great runtime out of these things. Even in my big, heavy, built rigs, these work really well. So I like these a lot. When you really want more juice, I've got these Urgenix 900 milliamp batteries. So the milliamp rating is kind of like your gas tank, as a subscriber actually explained it to me. It's like your gas tank. So the higher the number of the milliamps, the longer your runtime is going to be. So with a big fat 900 milliamp battery, you're going to get really good runtime. And you do with these things. They last significantly longer than any other 2S battery that I've used. They were inexpensive. I got them on Amazon and they've served me well. I have two of these. The only issue I have with these is the size. If you look at the thickness of these things, they're almost three times as thick as the stock battery. And I've run into significant problems with these on some of my rigs because I just, I can't close the bodies adequately with this size of a battery in there. So I use these in the rigs that will allow it because I love the runtime. These are great. To charge these things, I highly recommend that you get a good balance charger. You know, this does the job, but it's not really adequate. So this is what I use for a battery charger for my little lipos. It's important to note that I am not an expert on batteries or chargers, but I got this early on in the process because I wasn't ready to spend a bunch of money on a charger and I wanted something that was better than the factory charger. So I'm not telling you to buy this one. I'm encouraging you to explore charger options and get something upgraded from stock. This worked for me because it was about 25 bucks. It's fast, it's convenient, it's portable, and it's easy to use and understand. So I really like this charger. But it's, it's also really important to note that speed and convenience are not what's most important when it comes to a battery charger. 
safety and efficiency is. So definitely do your homework and check out battery chargers that work best for you and that give you peace of mind that you're gonna get adequate charging, safe charging, and can do all the batteries that you need. So with that said, this is a great little charger, entry level charger. Like I said, it was about 25 bucks on A Main Hobbies. It does a great job, does my two and three S batteries, charges them really quick. Like I said, you've just got one charging port here in the front. I can take my batteries, plug it in here. It's got the LED indicators at the top, tell you where it's at and it works really well. So I really enjoy it. I am overdue to get an upgraded charger. Like I said, I got this early on in the hobby and I just haven't replaced it because it's met my needs. But like you, I'm also going to explore upgraded chargers as you grow in the hobby. You should grow your education about these ancillary things because they are important. So I do like this charger. This is what I use personally, but do your research and find a charger that works best for you. Also encourage you to get a LiPo charging bag. You know, I talked about safety being number one with these things. The bags are inexpensive, you know, they're, they're fireproof. You know, you can leave your batteries in there to charge. You don't have to worry if there's an accident or anything, that bag's gonna help contain that and prevent potential disasters. So again, safety is key when it comes to these chargers and these batteries. For the transmitter, so you can go through a lot of double A's and triple A batteries. I use this EBL setup. So I, a long time ago, actually when I had my son and I started spending a fortune on batteries for his toys, I got into using EBL batteries. So I like this a lot. I keep this charger on my bench. These are rechargeable batteries. So I get the triple A's and I get the double A's. This runs my transmitters. So I've always got fresh recharged batteries. I'm not buying more and more. I'm just recharging the ones I have. So I really dig the EBLs. Although the, the double A's, the size can be an issue. They don't fit quite right in some transmitters and they're a little finicky. The triple A's seem to work really well. But nonetheless, I still think this is a worthy investment and I've enjoyed those. Diagnosing some common electrical issues. Now I get asked a whole myriad of questions about the finicky electronics on these things. Some of the most common ones are, I've lost my throttle in my reverse, but I still have steering. What does this blinking light do? Why is my servo jittering like this? Why do I have throttle, but no steering? A lot of other things that come up, but those are some of the core ones that you run into with these things. And thankfully they're pretty easy solutions for the most part. A lot of it can be fixed with just the transmitter, some real simple fixes and tweaks on the transmitter, and some is just replacing some weak factory electronics with some upgraded units. But let's take a look at some specific examples and I'll show you exactly what I mean and some solutions to these common issues. Let's demonstrate some of the issues that I just mentioned. So we're gonna turn our rig on here and we're gonna see what it does when I turn the transmitter on. There we go. See, right off the bat, I'm not touching anything. Wheels are jacked to the left and it's starting to take off on its own. I don't have a lot of control. Things are actually backwards. It appears that there's a whole lot of chaos happening right here. So what in the world could this be? Okay, Let's stop this for a second. So in this instance, I'm running the V2 electronics. And this is the one it has the blue accents on it. This is with the later generation SCX24s. If you look at this, you see this G LED light is blinking. Now this means that your batteries and your transmitter are low. So this, there's a couple things here. So if you ever question what that light means, with it's blinking like that, that's exactly what it is. It's telling you that the batteries and the transmitter itself are dead. So what we're gonna do is replace these batteries. I'm gonna show you what happens to the rig. See our light is gone. I'm gonna bring the C10 over and turn it back on. Back in business, no issues. Good steering, good throttle, everything is appropriate. So a lot of the times your issues are just replacing the batteries in the transmitter. Bad batteries in your transmitter can wreak havoc on your rig. Now I put severely dead batteries in this. Sometimes you'll get misbehaving rigs without the G LED light blinking on here, which kind of leaves you puzzled. But if you get some of those symptoms, primarily the weird steering and the kind of moving on its own, those are good indicators that 
it could be your batteries and your transmitter starting to fail. So the first thing I always tell people is replace the batteries in your transmitter. And a lot of times that just fixes it. Now there's a couple things that it won't fix. So let's say you do that and you still get some issues. A common issue is a jittery or misbehaving servo. I'll show you an example of what this looks like. So here's one I can demonstrate for you. This is an FCX24, but the principle is the same. You see the servo here when I talk about a jittery servo. So watch this thing. See, see it twitchy? It's right there. Yeah, there you go. It gets the tremors right there. When your servo starts to jitter like that, you know that it's kind of on its last legs. It's about to give up the ghost on you. Generally, cases like that means that your servo is going bad. If you get that real, that real jittery front wheel, and if it, you know, it starts to turn and lock on its own, that's a good indicator that your servo is toast. So a couple good budget replacement servos for beginners. I like the Emacs servo and I like the EcoPower servo. Both of these are around 10 or 15 bucks, really inexpensive. Both of these will require you to modify your existing servo tray or upgrade it to a newer, larger servo tray. I recommend doing the latter as the former is just kind of a band-aid fix and it doesn't fit nearly as well. So when you replace your servo, which you inevitably will, I suggest that you get an aluminum servo mount to go with it. It'll just make your life a lot easier. And the servo upgrade will be one of the first things you want to do. A couple of other things too, if you feel like your battery's dying really quickly and you're not sure why, let's say you put a brand new battery in it last night and you go to turn it on this morning and the thing's dead. You ought to make sure that you unplug your batteries from these things because the SCX24 has a wicked phantom draw. And if you leave the battery plugged in, even if everything is off, it will drain your battery. So always recommend when you're done playing with it for the day, just unplug your battery and kind of let that serve as your, your hard power switch. And that'll save your batteries. So a real common one is, let's say you've lost throttle response. You've got steering, but you've got no throttle. Now, if it doesn't solve it by changing the batteries in your transmitter, 99% of the time it's gonna be your ESC, your little box here. And this, this is a pretty simple swap. They're around 20 bucks, real simple. You just gotta replace this unit here and rebind your transmitter and that should take care of you. But if you've got steering and you've got no throttle, that's a pretty good indicator that your ESC is done. And vice versa too, if you've got throttle but no steering and you've done the batteries in your transmitter, that's a good indicator that your servo is toast. Tip number five, being prepared. So this isn't really in response to a very popular question, but it's something that I feel the need to share because it's something that I really benefited from and that has really helped me when I take my crawlers out, particularly if I go on extended trips or I take a road trip somewhere for a big meetup. Being prepared is key. You do not want to get out in the woods somewhere, out on the trail, out with your buddies at the hobby shop or something somewhere, or go to a competition and have something break, have something fail, not have the appropriate spare parts that you need to get your build back up and running, get you through the end of the day, and keep having fun. So I'm going to show you what I keep in my toolbox, what I use for a toolbox, what my must-haves are for my spare parts, and what I keep with me at all times when I take my crawlers out. So let's take a look. Here's my setup here. So this is my newer setup here. This is a 12-inch storage bin from Husky. It's just a nice compartmentalized storage container here. Works great for the mini crawlers. And I'll show you what my non-negotiables are that I always bring with me whenever I take off anywhere. So I keep this right on the side of my bench and I also pop this in my bag whenever I travel with my rigs. So let's go through kind of bin by bin here. In the front, I've got all my tools. Now these are the, the core set of tools that I went over in the first part of the video. You know, I've got all my screwdrivers, my hex drivers, my nut drivers, Loctite, grease, all that. This is kind of my core set I keep with me at all times. I always bring with me a spare motor always bring a spare servo. I keep zip ties. I mean, you can use zip ties for everything. So I always keep zip ties around. These are some bigger spare parts. These are for the Capra. So these are longer spare axles. I keep a bunch of 
body clips in here, hexes for the Capra. I keep a lot of spare hardware in different sizes for different builds. So I kind of have a variety of different hardware for any type of rig that I have. And this ranges from you know, your basic body hardware to your beadlock wheel screws, extra hexes, wheel nuts, all that stuff. I keep a lot of extra hardware. And I organize it by rig. So I've got kind of my SCX24 hardware in this bin. This is my Traxxas hardware and some of the Capra hardware because it's a different size. Same thing with the FMS hardware too. So I try to organize it by size. I keep spare axles, bearings, plenty of wheel nuts and wheel pins. I've run into the scenario many times where I've lost my wheel nut and or my wheel pin and it's miserable. I mean, you could Those things are like needle in a haystack when you lose them. So I always keep a significant amount of wheel nuts and wheel pins in here. Keep a lot of spare axle parts because that's one of the common things that I seem to break, you know, axle shafts. I've got, I keep a, a complete set actually. So if I break one axle, let's say I'm at a competition and it's really critical that I've got, you know, similarities in my build, I keep a full set of extended axles with weighted hexes and everything. It's kind of like my standard build set. So I keep a full set of axles and hex extensions and everything kind of on deck. I keep a variety of drive shafts. Now, especially when I moved into the brushless systems, when I was spitting out drive shafts all over the place before I went to steel units, I really got in the habit of keeping a variety of drive shafts. So I've got front and rear drive shafts for pretty much all of my builds here. And this is just good peace of mind. I keep a full set of extra shocks. And these are long travel power hobby shocks, kind of middle of the road length. They're a little bit longer than the 43s, but shorter than the 58s. So they'll fit on any one of my SCX 24s that I run just in case, you know, I, because again, I've lost the inner body of a shock on the trail before. And I was, you know, I was stranded. I couldn't use the rig anymore. So now I keep a full set of shocks. And finally, I keep a variety of batteries. You know, I try to bring one spare battery and keep one spare battery for any type of rig that I'm bringing. So again, I've got Capra, I've got the SCX 24s, 2S and 3S. I've got the Traxxas batteries and I've got the FMS. And so I've got batteries for every rig. So this is kind of my go-to travel case. And like I said, I keep this on my bench. This is kind of my working toolbox right here. I used to use a much bigger one. I used to use this HDX one from Home Depot, but I actually filled it and ran out of room. So I kind of use this as my backup and just keep extra stuff in there now and keep my smaller one kind of thinned out and minimalist here. But highly recommend having a setup like this that you can carry with you easy that doesn't take up a lot of space, but it's got your core components in it. All right, my friends, those are my five tips to get you started on the right foot with modifying your SCX24. But I got one more bonus tip for you. One of the most common questions that I get asked and was asked very early on and throughout my builds is what wheels do I use? What is my favorite wheel and what do I recommend for a beadlock wheel? My answer was and still is the stamped steel beadlocks. I love these wheels for a bunch of reasons. Number one is that they have the four piece design which allows you to flip the hub around to the front of the wheel the traditional front and give you that real cool looking deep dish look but also give you three or four millimeters of extra width to your track and that's really beneficial however these wheels are very difficult to put together the next question that i inevitably get is how do you assemble these things so i figured i'd give you guys my tips on how to assemble the stamp steel beadlock wheel now there's a bunch of videos out there, particularly on the paperclip method on how to do this, and that works great, but I'm gonna show you what works for me. I don't use the paperclip method personally because I've kind of found a workaround that lets me do this pretty quickly without having to use that. So I'm gonna show you exactly what I do to put together these stamped steel beadlock wheels. So let's take a look at an example here. 
So here are the wheels that I'm talking about here. This is what it looks like fully assembled. You see they got this nice deep dish wheel in the front. The hub is on the back. When you put it on here, it gives you that nice deep dish look and also that real wide track and that aggressive stance that I get asked about all the time. So I love these wheels. These are Injura stamp steel wheels. RC four wheel drive, I think made these initially in the one inch size. The only difference primarily is that the Injuras use a 1.3 millimeter screw, whereas the RC four wheel drive uses a 1.5. So just something to keep in mind. Both of them work great. I will add that the Injuras accept aftermarket hexes much better than the RC four wheel drive units do. Just a heads up there. So the finished product looks like this. When you get it out of the package, they come looking like this. It's like I said, they're a four piece design. You have your ring, you have your two pieces of the wheel go together like that. And then your hub goes on whichever end of the wheel that you want it to, depending on how you want your wheel set up. What's tricky is lining these things up, getting the screw through the hole on both sides and into the hub. So it's frustrating at first. It can be very frustrating. I remember doing my first set of wheels, took me like two hours, but through lots of trial and error and practice and repetition, I've got it down where I can do a wheel in about five or 10 minutes to depend on what tire I'm using. So I'm gonna try to put the camera over my shoulder here. We can do this together. I'm gonna show you exactly how we assemble this. We're gonna do one live here and I'll give you my tips and tricks on how to put one of these things together. All right, no pressure, right? Let's do this together here. So hopefully you can see this okay. So first thing you do, you're gonna take your ring, you're gonna put it inside the tire with your foam in it. Center it as much as you can. I like to squish the foam around. Make sure you've got a good ring seat in there. Next up, I'm gonna take my deep dish side. I'm gonna put this and seat it onto the tire. Now, if you're doing directional tires like the scramblers are here, make sure that you know where this tire is going to sit on the build and which side. So if you want this on the outside, make sure that the tread is pointing in the direction that you want it to go and you know where exactly on the rig this is going to be so that you can maintain your direction. Now, what the next step here, this is where it gets a little tricky. I'm gonna to try to show you this. I look for my reference point. And you see these things have, there are six holes throughout, but there's only one of them that lines up in the center of one of the triangle cutouts of the wheel design. So I use that as my reference point. You can see it right there. So I got kind of my, my reference point right there. That's the one unique mark on this wheel. Now I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna put my hub in here while I can see through this wheel. I'm just gonna line it up visually so I can see light through each one of the holes. Now I'm just gonna set this down. Now see what's tricky with the Endura wheels is that that hub doesn't stick very well in the wheel. With the RC four wheel drives, they have they snap right in there. They don't go anywhere. So this gets a little tricky because now I've lost the holes in my hub. So a trick that I like to do, take something, I usually will work on a glass table or you can use something clear, like this is a just a storage container. And I'm just gonna put this on top of it here and that way you can look down through it so you can see light underneath and see when it's lined up. Okay, we've got our reference point right there. Everything looks lined up. Now I'm going to take my wheel and I'm going to find that exact reference point on my wheel. And I can see it right there. Now I'm going to find it on this piece as well and I'm just going to look straight down over the top of it. I'm just going to line it up using the light from behind it to guide me there. I'm just going to set it directly over it. 
Now I'm going to grab a screw. Now I'm going to set that screw right in my one visual point. And that lines you up. So now you're good. I only tighten this just you know, a couple, couple turns just to grab it. And then I go around and just look at the tire, make sure that I've got a good bead all the way around because the last thing you want to do is tighten them all down and realize that your bead's coming out. So next I'm going to do, I don't need my box anymore because I've got my good start. So the next I'm just going to start putting screws in on the opposite side. Again, just barely tightening it. I'm going to check each time I put a screw in, I'm going to check and make sure that my bead is holding. I'm going to go back up, always kitty corner it to go to the opposite side of the wheel. They're looking good. I didn't check after each time because we got a real good bead going here. It's got a nice seal. It's looking good. Now I'm just going to go around and start tightening them in the opposite corners and opposite ends of the wheel. Not tightening them completely. I'm just going to snug them up and just kind of jump around here across from each other. Looking good. And I'm just going to repeat that pattern until everything is snug. Remember from tip number one, do not over tighten. They just need to be snug. They do not need to be tight. These little screws will strip out. You do not want to strip out a wheel screw. that's it just like that that's it right there that's how I assemble these wheels like I said I got it down pretty quick that was only what three or four minutes I think for one of them so I got it to a point where it's pretty quick but it's just line it finding your reference point lining it up I like to use the clear work surface so the light shines underneath so that you can see when you're lined up drop it down on top and then just start screwing it down so that's going to wrap it up for the video. I hope you found this helpful. I hope these tips get you off to the right foot when you start modifying your SCX24 or any mini crawler. There's a lot of transferable information here to other crawlers as well, although we primarily focused on the SCX24 here. One of the key learnings that I've experienced through this hobby and one of the most enjoyable things that I've found is learning through trial and error. You know, these little things are fun. They're fun to tinker with. They're fun to work on. They're fun to upgrade. It's very rewarding and you can put 20 or $30 mods on them and see the gains right away. And being able to do the work yourself and get in there and tinker just is very rewarding to me and really gives you a sense of satisfaction when you do the work, you see the performance gains, and you build the rig how you want. But it's tedious getting there. So I encourage you to just take your time embrace mistakes, learn from your mistakes, and just have fun in the process. And always feel free to reach out to me. You know, I'm always happy to answer questions in the comments or you know, shoot me an email. Happy to help out as much as I can. So let me know your thoughts down below if you've got any additional tips and tricks that some beginners can use. Definitely want to hear from you all. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate your time. Please like and subscribe if you haven't done so, and I'll see you in the next video.